Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Backtracking, the podcast where we look back at the real-world inspirations behind classic episodes of Star Trek. I'm one of your hosts, Caliban, and Black Lives Matter, and I'm joined on this episode by my co-host. I'm Gooey, and also Black Lives Matter. And we have returned to explore the inspirations behind your favorite episodes of Star Trek. And this week, we are looking at how the events of the past inspired a two-part DS9 episode from the recent past, which was set in the near future, that looks a lot like our present, QED. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a little depressing. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, but let's talk about, uh, before we start, some non-depressing news uh, from the world of Star Trek. Uh, we have, in the past weeks that we've been off, gotten some new information about upcoming Star Trek shows. It looks like Lower Decks is set to premiere on August 6th with a first season of 10 episodes. Yeah, and the, with the trailer came out with that too, right? Yeah, the trailer uh, two came out. Yeah, what'd yeah. you think? Um, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not super excited about it, but I'll. I'll give it a watch. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's tough to. I mean, you got to sell a show, and so you got to kind of put the sizzle out there, or just put the elements out there that you think will attract people. And so, I think um, it seems kind of goofy and, and light, and I think it's going to be probably more um what's the right adjective i think it's going to be more involved than some of the trailers make it seem do you know what i mean sure like i can buy that yeah yeah because you can't take a guy you know who like a rick and morty writer and throw him in there and also a guy who is just steeped in this stuff like he's been a star trek fan and written about star trek for years and have it just be kind of fart jokes or, or whatever do you know what i mean i think it's going to be a little more a little deeper than that i one thing I, I guess I am kind of hoping for is like maybe by nature of it being a more car- like a cartoon show like this, so like maybe the stories will be more contained. So that might be kind of cool is if it is a, has kind of a throwback feel in that way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it would be very difficult to have um, like an ongoing serialized developing story. Um, I guess if they take a shot at that, I wouldn't mind seeing it. But yeah. Yeah, I think a little more just one-off, uh, especially you know, goofy <laughs> cartoon adventures could be yeah. kind of fun. If it is that, it's like, then it's, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get too mad because it's like, well, you know, there's kind of like these cartoon episodes, <laughs> low stakes, you know? Yeah, stakes is <laughs> extremely low. Um, I find it interesting, too, that they even managed to kind of work in the kind of themes of Star Trek into the, the trailers that I saw, like... Because they're really concerned about being a good, you know, officer or upholding the you know b- beliefs of Starfleet or whatever, and that's cool and all. I mean, that would fit every single iteration of Trek so far. But kind of want them to just toss that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like we created an entire show, this podcast, to talk about like other pieces of media that resonate with the themes of Star Trek episodes. But I'm okay with leaving themes out of this one. Yeah, and it's almost like we've kind of we've seen that a lot, you know. And yeah. <laughs> that that's almost something that's like even even when our serious treks try to do that, sometimes it feels like walking a well worn path, you know. Yeah. But now especially I feel like that would stick out in a a show that's m- maybe meant to be a bit more lighthearted, you know? Yeah. Something like um the live action Tribbles short trek that they did. But not yes. that though. Like may take something like that. Yeah, make that animated and I think that would work. I really liked, well. yeah, I liked that one kind of conceptually. So yeah. like, and and I also kind of liked that uh, the captain in it was kind of <laughs> bad, like kind of passing the blame on a guy by the end. Like that was funny <laughs> to me, you know. The, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, at the end where she's just like, he was an idiot or something. I kind of, yeah, was, I kind of enjoyed him. it just because it was like cool to see like, you know, a, a captain who is tested and kind of fails, you know? Yeah, right, right. I mean, and you it's know, funny. Th- 30 seconds after that episode ends, like, she, you know, loses her commission and she's working a garbage scout for the rest of her life. But, like, in a cartoon, I, I, you know, that doesn't matter. I think you could have that where the captain's oh, just yeah. like, what's, what, what are you idiots doing? <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, part of the reason why I'm less excited, too, is I've built up the idea in my mind of, uh, an animated series where they just reuse the old animation and make a new show. And that's, oh. that, that, that seems like an even better show to me. <laughs> just the old filmation stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just cut it. Just 
and it can be you know new adventures of kirk and spock and mccoy um, <laughs> you know yeah. in lower decks they could like time travel and end up in kirk's era and it's like the filmation oh style of animation that's amazing yeah i was i was talking to a, a guy the other day um an author named ryan Britt, and he was talking about his his fan theory or his pet theory of the reason that starfleet has so many costume changes is that so when you end up time traveling uh, on a Starfleet mission, as you know, undoubtedly will, you'll and you meet other Starfleet yeah. members, you'll know exactly where you are. Very it's, it's convenient. Like, okay, yeah, they got the collars, so this is like twenty three sixties. Okay, yeah, we got it. Yeah, every <laughs> yeah every time someone shows up in Next Gen, like Kelsey Grammer shows up, you're like, okay, I know. Where okay, you're he's from. got the the maroon jacket on, but what like, what year? What decade is this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love that. Uh, also, we heard that Star Trek Discovery Season 3 will premiere on October 15th with a season of 13 episodes, which gives us 23 weeks of Trek. <laughs> cool. They've, I you'll be really busy, huh? Pushing, <laughs> they're really pushing that in the marketing, and everybody's super excited. They're like, oh my god, there's 23 consecutive weeks of Trek. And my first question is, has there ever been 23 weeks of Trek? Like, that's... Even when there's a show on that has, say, 26 episodes, there's weeks off. You know, they do reruns. I don't think we've ever had in human history 23 weeks of track hmm. on TV. Yeah, it sticks out more now. Like, even even if they didn't do it back in the 90s, like, that wouldn't ever be an, a big advertisement, uh, you know? Maybe you could work. Well, even when they had two shows on at once, though, they would probably take similar breaks, though. So, oh, that'd be great if you could actually look. And of course, there's syndication. Like... Well, I'm not going to look. I don't care. But yeah, we actually but, had uh, 200 weeks of Trek. Yeah, yeah, that's well. Yeah, with syndication, you know, every day's Trek day. But yeah, and then the second thing I think you already said, which is, oh my god, oh god, 23 live show, 23 weeks of live shows, 23 weeks of uh, booking guests, uh, 23 weeks of trying to coordinate three people getting on to talk about something. Yeah. Um, looking forward to it yeah the co- the content mill <laughs> is really, going really looking forward to it fire yeah. fire up the podcast machines i think they're making the best of it i don't think there's any way that because i mean clearly like they're having fun with this 23 weeks of trek thing but without the coronavirus pandemic they never would have done this before right one of these would have come out sooner yeah i guess yeah i guess so now i mean now because i feel like the time. idea was yeah they've talked about having almost consecutive like we're so we've got all these shows coming up we've designed it so like you'll watch discovery then there'll be a, be a little break and then you'll watch the Giorgio show and then there'll be a little break and then you'll watch an animated show but they're just plowing through here we're gonna yeah. hit we've talked about <laughs> trek saturation and we're gonna we're gonna find out about trek saturation right. real fast i guess i'm i'm interested for it to start happening because i felt like for so long it was just like hearing about shows but yeah, not, yeah. Not them not coming. And I mean, we've got Picard and right. we're three seasons in Discovery. But then they were like, and there's going to be this show and this show and this show. Yeah. And one of them's finally coming out. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of hearing about shows, we've heard that the new Nickelodeon show will be called Star Trek Prodigy. And mm. I don't think we know actually too much else about it. But uh, yeah, it'll be coming out soon, sometime in the future. So we just know a title. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's a kid's show. Yeah, it's uh, on Nickelodeon. Cool, and it will be. Um, it'll have a more of a, I think, um, kind of educational focus. Um, it's going to be. Um, I don't know. I've just. I actually don't know what I can say because I've talked to some people who um, are working on it. Um, oh. but the the impression I get is that it will. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be for younger viewers, and they will try to. Fit a little more like science and a little. It'll be the opposite of <laughs> lower decks, basically. Yeah, like that's cool. Still, still pleasant and enjoyable, but yeah, be a little more focused in that that's, way. That's like the perfect realm, I think, for Star Trek. You know, to get into is like having some fun stuff for kids. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you and I are both animated series converts, and I yeah. think we often kind of scratch our heads and wonder why hasn't Star Trek cartoons been a thing for the last forty years? Yeah, you can trick kids into thinking about satan and stuff like that so. uh, yes <laughs> right <laughs> uh so if we're trying to get this you know agenda Pil- pushed, kids <laughs> pilgrims and satan your favorite yeah your favorite cereal <laughs> um 
So yeah, that'll be coming out sometime next year is the plan right now. And then, of course, they'll program it with season four of Discovery and season two of Lower Decks so we can have 47 weeks of Trek. Yeah. Whatever whatever it turns into. Well, I assume they haven't made more Discovery, right? Because now now can you make TV shows right now? I think they barely finished this one. Um, Ah. You know, I've been kind of keeping up on the saga of them uh, doing the the score, like, you know, the um, orchestral score for the show which has been one of the big slowdowns. And it's because, you know, you can't get 50 people together and have them all blowing air out constantly in one room. And so what they've been doing is they've been recording a lot of the parts um, individually. So I just presume if you're a professional musician in Hollywood, you probably have a real quiet room in your house and and a good microphone. And so people have literally been recording their parts individually. Yeah. And then the... Um, the music designer or the conductor has had to um, engineer them all together, you know, in, you know, a DAW or whatever he's got and then publish it like that. So I'm wondering, we'll probably never even know what any kind of difference, but I'm wondering if that would affect the kind of compositions that you would do. And if we'll see a different uh, tenor, so to speak, to the music. On yeah. The show. Yeah. Because like, I'm not. Super. Why are they doing this steel string guitar, like this acoustic thing? <laughs> yeah, it's a different kind of thing. It's neat. Yeah, I'm not like super hip to recording and stuff like that, but I assume, you know, the the quality of a sound in a private room in your house is going to be way different than, you know, recording in a kind of the larger rooms they do with the acoustics and everything. So I wonder That's if, true. if they are either, like you said, maybe they score around it, or I'm sure there's probably just going to be a lot of like post-production on that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can do a lot with, with that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's like the people, the main actors on The Simpsons, they haven't gone to a studio in like 20 years. They all just do that <laughs> from home. They've already so. been uh, sheltering in place. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Nancy Cartwright has a compound that she just lives in. <laughs> Got to protect the Simpsons cast at all costs. That golden throat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, let's, we can't put it off any longer. Let's get into our uh, intense subject for today's show. Uh, The recent high profile killings of African Americans by police officers have sparked a wave of protests around the country and the world, revealing the deep seated frustrations and resentment that minorities and sympathetic groups possess for over aggressive militaristic policing and similar law enforcement policies. And systematic racism and oppression weren't eradicated by the civil rights movement, nor were they reinvented by the right wing and white supremacist politicians of the 21st century. Systemic means built into the system and America's criminal justice system has long been conditioned to over police, over incarcerate and ignore the concerns of minorities. And this fact was made chillingly clear by the response to the Attica prison riot of 1971, which resulted in the deaths of 39 inmates and 10 correctional officers at the hands of the New York State Police. Uh, They'll say, um, you're here now, you're in Attica. We are the bosses. You do what we tell you. We tell you to walk, you walk. We tell you to eat, you eat. We tell you to sleep, you sleep. We tell you not to talk, we don't talk. Uh, They don't look at us like human beings. Meanwhile, they are the ones that are the animals. And it functions you in a capacity as more or less like a vegetable because you're not able to think anymore because you're told what to do and when to do and how often to do it, right? I, mean, I don't think that any sane person can tolerate it. I don't care who you are. You're looking for humane treatment. That's all. Humane treatment. We are given a bath once a week, very briefly, once a week. You see? These things, you're you're taking away the bare necessities. Things that a man needs to feel like he's a human being. These are taken away. He don't have them. We watched an excellent and horrifying documentary in preparation for this called Simply Attica. Yeah. And it was uh, organized and directed by a woman named Cinda Firestone uh, in 1974. And it is, um, you know, we've learned, and we'll talk about this later, but we've learned... Uh, over the years through the release of documents and interviews, we've learned a lot more about this situation, but this documentary is incredible because it was, you know, as as almost literally once the smoke cleared, you know, work started on this documentary. So you were seeing 
um, footage from the incident. You are seeing interviews with prisoners who survived it, you know, who are literally not, they are just at like a year out from having survived this horrible experience, uh, talking about um, their experiences, the conditions uh, in the Attica prison. And it's, it's an incredible um, story. And it's amazing because even with what the things that we've learned uh, with the commissions that have been done and the release of sealed documents, it's amazing how accurate it is. You know, there's so little of it that yeah. could be refuted by any later facts. Yeah, that's I, that's what feels so important about it. Because I thought I thought that too. Like I watched it, and then as the time was coming closer to recording, I, I I hadn't thought about it. Like, oh, you know, there's probably more to this now to know, but I didn't consider it first because like it it does feel so thorough, and it's it's mm-hmm. you know a lot of it is does feel like you know it's very recent, and it's like just capturing that moment so well. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, and it's something we'll see in the episode we're going to talk about, but even now it's like, you know, just the importance of kind of actually getting that kind of perspective and not just like, you know, whatever is reported about it or, you know, like yeah. the actual yeah, people's <laughs> side of it. That's ironic because the episode deals with um, a sort of tweak to the history and something that, you know, uh, wasn't recorded necessarily in history, um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean it's it's amazing. I mean, there's been later um, accounts, there's been later like autobiographies, um, but it's just you'd expect it to be you know, an, an emotional response to it, and it is. But it's also just so accurate and so thorough. Um, and this into Firestone. She's done a couple more things, oh, um, but okay. not not really. Um, and if you recognize her name, she's from the Firestone family, the you know Firestone uh, company uh, tires the and tires? things like that. Oh. Yeah, okay. And this was so controversial that she was basically like cut <laughs> out of the family uh, for making this. Oh wow! Well, good for her. Yeah, good for her indeed. Um, yeah. The Attica prison riots took place from uh, September 9th to the thirteenth in nineteen seventy one. And at that time, the Attica prison, um, which was, you know, infamous as a like a bad place to go. You didn't want to go there. It was holding about twenty two hundred prisoners, which I think the documentary says or I read somewhere that it was about six hundred more than it had been designed to hold at that time. Yeah, I think and, I had saw, saw like each guard was responsible for like around like 60 inmates. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I don't know like what the normal number is, but that sounds real high. Yeah, I mean there's I, there's a lot of issues with the normal situation obviously, yeah, but this right. is yeah. just that uh compounded or exaggerated even more yeah. so. And the conditions in the prison were med- medieval. They were horrible. Um the they had no um uh Medical services, uh, or at least inadequate medical services. If you got hurt, you were kind of on your own. There was overcrowding uh, to cells. There's like four men to a two-person cell. Um, they were underfed, and they were having to share food and supplies like amongst themselves. Um, and they weren't, as far as I could tell, allowed to receive anything from the outside. No, you know I, mean? yeah. I don't mean like a cake with a saw in it or whatever. Like just no care packages, nothing. Um, they had no access to uh, continuing education. Um, they received one shower a week and one yeah. roll of toilet paper per week. Um, and the guards were brutal to them. Like the prisoners were brutalized. Um, there was, you know, a lot of beatings and a lot of injuries that would require the kind of medical treatment that they couldn't receive. And so they had petitioned the warden for relief on these issues, but nothing had really been done. Um, the uh, I had read that the commissioner had like played a tape to the inmates uh, like the week before saying that, oh, changes are going to come, you know, over over a brief period of eight months. And so it wasn't great. You know, tensions were at a, at a high between the staff and the inmates. And recently, um, I think maybe two weeks before uh, there had been a, a, a story where um, a guy named George Jackson, who was a member, member of the Black Panther Party, and an author had been killed in an escape attempt from San Quentin in California. And so a lot of the prisoners were, you know, thinking about that. That was on their mind. And on the day the riot started, it was early in the morning, and there was a situation where there was a change in the schedule, and some of the guards hadn't been informed. And so a group of prisoners got stuck in a hallway uh, where a door hadn't been opened for them on their way to, to wherever they were going. 
And they were thinking at this point, you know, they were paranoid because of all the beatings and stuff. So they're thinking, this is it. Like, they've corralled us into here. We're going to get jumped, you know, and beaten by the staff um, in retaliation for an incident that had happened um, the day before where a, a guy had thrown a can at somebody's head or something. And when the guards did arrive, presumably to take them back to their cells, we don't know, uh, the inmates slashed out and fought them, and the whole thing exploded. And about uh, 1,300 of Attica's prisoners got involved uh, in this riot. They took 42 uh, of the staff hostage and moved everybody into the large central yard. Um, They made demands uh, to the commissioner of corrections, a guy named Russell Oswald, who was essentially in charge of the entire Mm. situation. Uh, because uh, the governor, Nelson Rockefeller, had decided to basically stay out of it. Uh, The inmates had organized. um, They designated spokesmen for the negotiations. And during the the standoff, um, like I said, they had been living in the central yard. Um, For a lot of them, it was the first time that they'd spent more than an hour outside in years. Holy cow. Um, They cleaned up the hostages and gave them clean clothes, and they basically just had them live there with them for the four days of negotiations. And what's crazy is, is when you think of the 21st century as being the real age of citizen journalism and cameras in our pockets and being inside a crisis while it's happening, um, the inmates invited the press and observers to come inside the prison and see what was going on. Yeah. So in the dock, there's all this incredible footage of, you know, the inmates speaking out and being interviewed, the hostages speaking out and being interviewed, and you literally see everyone involved, many of whom would be dead in just a few hours. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And one, so, yeah, that, that really stuck out to me. And then, um, I, you know, when I was reading more into it outside of the documentary, too, it's, it seemed like a lot of uh, leading up to this and then beyond this, it was, it was just so much, um, so much, was like escalated by the prison itself you know like i uh one one thing i was reading was about how due to the the death in uh california like some of the prisoners in attica were like showing solidarity uh they had like their own little like protests going on there and then Mm -hmm. uh they were like basically punished for it and Yeah. yeah and it just reminds me so much of today where it's like or you know throughout time where it's like um even like the slightest show of solidarity or support results in uh immediate punishment and then that that of course never de-escalates anything it just makes it worse you know so that on top of the conditions it's just insane yeah um it's (laughs) like the things that happened leading up to this uh, the things that happened uh, when the prison was taken back and the things that happened immediately after are, you know, horrifying. And you wonder how <laughs> you wonder how like people can do this to other people, but they feel justified to do it because up to this point, you know, the courts and the system have already bestialized these men. You know, they've just made them into not people. Um, one of the interviewees, uh, you know, one of the inmates says in the dock that they were just, they were treated like animals essentially. And so <laughs> when you, when you, you know, think about somebody, and if you put yourself in the mind of, you know, a, a, a commissioner of corrections uh, in New York state, uh, you just, you're not even thinking like, all right, so what, what are they asking for? What do they need? What's happening there? It just becomes, you know, immediately no negotiation, yeah. defend, defend the system, defend our position. There's a right. horrifying – I got kind of deep on this. I ended up finding like a um, a Democracy Now! video from a couple years ago where they had unsealed some documents and they had um, released some uh, tapes of Nixon talking to Rockefeller at the time because Nixon, you know, recorded everything. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're talking about it and he's like, I fully support, you know, what you did. And can, can I ask you a question? Uh, what, is, this, is this mainly the blacks? Is this the blacks doing this? <laughs> And right. Rockefeller's like, yes, yes, Mr. President. Oh, yes, it's all blacks. And that's, of course, that's not true at all. Like 50% of the population of the prison was black and the rest was totally diverse. And you see this in the documentary, too. So it's just not – you're thinking the wrong thing, guys. You're looking at this from the wrong perspective. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, from the start. Yeah, the negotiation thing you mentioned, like that was a big thing that stuck out, too. Again, with like the – like there is there is an alternate route here for for them to do something else. 
yeah. uh, in this situation where, you know, the, the, the prisoners just wanted to talk, it seems. And then mm-hmm. they were like, they, I feel like in response, they did everything they could to uh, just get to armed conflict with them. I mean, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They had, um, they invited press in. Um, they had like um, some lawyers in to help with the negotiations and talk to people, some civil rights lawyers, and it just, nothing seemed to work. And the demands were not, uh, I, I don't think that they were um, completely sky high. Um, they were just asking to rectify the problems that we had mentioned before. They wanted better conditions and better food, an end to the physical brutality, access to books right. and continuing yeah. education. Yeah. They wanted, the sticking point for the governor and for New York at least was they wanted amnesty from prosecution for the takeover. Um, you know, they didn't want to be charged for the crimes uh, that, you know, the quote unquote crimes that they had committed um, in taking the prison over. And they wanted the, um, the warden removed at Attica. And that was too much for Rockefeller. That was one of the straws that uh, broke the camel's back in terms of sending people in. Right. Yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. The, uh, in the documentary and also elsewhere, I've seen some other video of this guy. Uh, you see Commissioner Russell G. Oswald, who is the uh, Correctional Services Commissioner, and he's uh, he's a real he's a real character. The, some of the interviews or whatever they were doing with him in that were totally insane. Yeah, were they... he's like a character out of a Tennessee Williams play. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, he's like a, a almost a parody of a, a real person a little bit too. But I mean, he's a real person. I yeah, <laughs> like yeah. It... In the commit, yeah, and in the the commission that they held after the incident, you see um, prisoners, you see guards, you see everybody like testifying and sort of doing their doing their best to you know to speak honestly about what's happening. You know, when I think about it's weird because when I think about like people testifying now, like I don't know, like William Barr, for instance, and watching somebody think of all the ways that they can sort of prevaricate or like wiggle their way out of the questions. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you watch this, the, the commission in the documentary, it's just a progression of guy, white guys and buzz cuts. Mm-hmm. And so you, <laughs> you can, you can try to make a guess about, you know, how they felt about what they did or what sort of quote unquote side they be on, but they're all pretty much like, you know, being forthcoming. They're all like answering the questions. They have a respect for the appointed commission you know but it's like they're whether or not they they like hitting black men in the head you know with their truncheons or not like they're telling you what happened and i don't know what what happened to that sort of respect for like the rule of law and authority um oh oh. wait a minute we're watching it right now (laughs) we're talking about it yeah (laughs) the the slow erosion of it over over the years um but anyway yeah the the prisoners continue to uh unsuccessfully negotiate with um with oswald and um you know, it, it, it wasn't great. Like, I think even at the point where, like I said, like when the amnesty, um, the the negotiations over getting the amnesty broke down because the prisoners eventually gave up on the warden thing. And they're like, fine, the warden can stay, but we don't want to be prosecuted for this. Um, I think that was the last straw. And Rockefeller told them to go in and they gave no real indication. Like he was Oswald was still negotiating with them while the order came in to basically to, to rush the prison. And Rockefeller didn't do anything throughout any of this. Like, he refused a request by the prisoners to come to Attica and to talk with them. Yeah, just to talk, yeah. Yep, yeah. And at the time, he was looking to, I think, shore up his reputation as being tough on crime, you know, a real law and order governor. So him meeting with them or any kind of amnesty, as far as he was concerned, was out of the question. So he gave the go-ahead for the assault. And you can see in the documentary, it's like clouds forming. Like, you can see them assembling the state police. Um, yeah. And this is this is brought up in the doc, but it's also in the 50 years of journalism since. They took anybody they can get their hands on for this force to take back the prison. Like, recruit untrained recruits, retired state police. They were taking, like, retired correctional officers. Anybody who wanted a shotgun or a rifle. That's uh, always to, a good way to get. Got to line yeah. up for this thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. And there's this, there's this, there's this fat fucking guy with like aviator sunglasses who like just walked out of central casting, uh, <laughs> who's like giving them their orders, and he's like, "All right, we're gonna go in, we're gonna do the thing." It's just like Jesus Christ. 
That's mix it up a little. Who you want to handle a, de- <laughs> yeah. a delicate situation. Yeah, right. And it just, for me, it was just like chillingly reminiscent of seeing, you know, lines of police, you know, outside of CHOP, you know, or uh, in Minneapolis, just seeing uh, all these guys getting together, got the sticks, you know, all lined up. They're ready. Got one thing on their mind. They're going to crack some heads. Yeah, random, like, police... Uh, units made up of like <laughs> retired people or you know like oh, yep. yeah people in plain clothes like who are these people where did they yeah. get find them yeah they're, they're a gang yeah yeah and uh oswald you know the, the whole line from new york at that time was you know we we've got to we've got to put this a uh, stop to this you know it's threatening the security of the entire judicial system it threatens our free society and you know, all that sort of rhetoric right And, of course, I mean, it's, you know, also just ringing true with today and and all of that is, you know, sending this armed group in, like, to, like, they're way outgunned, you know what I mean? Like, but yet somehow they, well, not somehow, it's just like, I don't know, too much, too much force given. And then obviously they're, they're uh, still, still somehow, even though they're armed to the teeth you know, killing people. Yeah. The corrections department doesn't have the money to give, you know, them three meals a day. But if we need to just start handing out unlimited shotguns and rifles like that, this is, that's got that. Yeah. And yeah. And I don't know. It just seemed like, yeah, just such an excessive force, obviously, but yeah. Yeah. Well, at, uh, in the morning on, uh, September 13th, um, they flew helicopters over the prison and dropped tear gas into the yard (sighs) And then that's when the troopers just opened fire. They just shot nonstop uh, for two minutes into right. the smoke. Like it wasn't even s- to apprehend them or anything. Yep. It was like, no, we're just going to start shooting yep. into the smoke, basically. You can, you can see this in the dock. And I don't know who thought this was a hot idea on the police department. But like one of the, one of the state police has like a, a camera on his rifle, like a gun camera. <laughs> why would cops? Why would a cop put a gun, a, a camera on his gun? I don't understand that. Gun cam, uh, huh. just for not, you know, yeah, to avoid prosecution. But and you can just see, like, just ind- indiscriminately firing. There's a great scene in the doc where um, I guess he's a state trooper or state police guy. They ask uh, him to show them like how this bolt action rifle works and how quickly you can shoot. And he sets it up, and he just goes, "Okay," and tell me to go, go. And he goes, "Bam, bam, bam, bam." He just shoots like ten times, and so you can just shoot so fast with these guns. And now imagine like two hundred state police just doing this, like into essentially, you know, a barrel, fish in a barrel. Yeah, of of the prisoners, and then of the of the hostages, they're trying to get back. You know, it's just yeah. yeah there's clearly no regard for any life in there. Yeah, and yeah. when the smoke had cleared. Uh, 29 inmates were dead. I think around 90 were wounded. Um, and the nine of the hostages were dead. And there were reports, um, rumors really the day before that the inmates had killed some of the hostages, like slit their, slit their throats. And the news media ran with that, speaking of like fake news. So even when they were pulling bodies out of the prison, like the, the report on the evening news was, you know, hostages killed by inmates. But in reality, one of the hostages had died of head injury during the initial riot and the other nine all died by police bullets during the assault. Right. Yeah. Just again, the, the blatant, it's, it's not even like trying to, to hide it. <laughs> like just the no. blatant hypocrisy. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there was a, a process of suppressing, uh, you know, the, the inmates and getting everybody, um, back where they're supposed to be. And they say this in the documentary. Also, this was in some of the um, documents that were un- unsealed in 2015. But that was, it wasn't just putting people back in their cells. Like there was, uh, they were just they brutalized the prisoners. Uh, they stripped them naked and made them crawl through the yard. Um, there's accounts, eyewitness accounts of them taking people's glasses and like dentures away and like smashing them, like just depriving them of basic like human functions and rights. And it was payback time. Yeah, that's yeah. I didn't know about that that part. That is extremely I mean, not surprising, but it's yeah, very messed up. Yeah, um, 
you know, just hitting hitting in the balls and calling in the N word and just doing all kinds of yeah cool stuff. Yeah. So um, this led to a uh, a commission, uh, the McKay Commission, that was nominally um, organized or um, uh, ordered by the governor. And they had dozens of hearings, and eventually um, they concluded uh, the commission by criticizing the um, New York State prison authorities and and the governor, too. Um, And they chastised the officials for the bad planning and their almost instant embrace of lethal methods. And they criticized uh, Rockefeller for not visiting the prison site uh, before ordering, you know, an armed assault on the prison. Yeah, I mean... I guess there was something there, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's just insane to me that th- these are still, uh, things we're talking about or like dealing with, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it, now knowing what I know now in my life, it makes sense, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big focus, uh, or at least part of the, uh, f- a focus of the documentary is just the idea of rehabilitation. Cause this isn't just like a news report about what happened. Like it's really trying to dig into the prison industrial complex, you know, and the idea of that, like, why, why are these men here? Yeah. Why are they in this situation? Why are we doing this? And of course that's been looked into for years and years, you know, the, the great um, uh, 13th documentary on Netflix looks into this and they, they bring the warden up. I think his name is Mancusi. They bring the warden up and they're asking him about this. And he had, like no answer. Like it was like it was like Billy. It's like Billy Madison. Like he's like uh, the thing about rehabilitation is uh, you oh know my it's God. Oh, yeah. rehabilitation is a thing, and I mean he has no idea what his job is for or why he's doing it. And it's just it's an industry that functions off of these 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 failures. You know they they start to talk about the prison industrial complex in the third act of the doc, and the idea that you know they call it like the town of Attica basically because the kind of Work they do, especially metal work, is dirt cheap when it's prison labor, right? And so there are a lot of industries that rely on the dirt cheap labor of of the prison. So you want to keep people in there so they can do this work so these other outside businesses can function. And it's it's, it's just – Yeah, just slavery it's basically. Yeah. It's slavery. Yeah. yeah. It's nuts. And it's something that I, I just think that if we talked about it – 10% more, something might change. Because you think about how many people are incarcerated in this country, and maybe the majority of them are, or a majority of them are, are minorities. And since we don't listen to the voices of minorities, like we're not mm-hmm. going to deal with this anyway. But it's just, it's crazy to think how much of our economy relies on, like you said, essentially this slave labor system that we've set up. Yeah, I mean, well, we found so many ways or like they've found so many ways to like frame the conversation around you know not it's it's more about like the individual person you know like yeah yeah like oh there's criminals and there, you know like not yeah. or you know and sometimes you know you'll get the the uh conditions brought up which is obviously a, that's very important but then it it kind of stops short there and then it doesn't go f- further which is like should this even exist or, <laughs> you know, something like yeah. that. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I like I this lot... documentary hit all of that. Yeah, it did. And a lot of the inmates, you know, uh, were talked about that and felt the same way. You know, they, they keep bringing up real rehabilitation, but the, a lot of inmates are just like, there is none. Like we don't, we don't have a library, you know, we don't have access. We can't better ourselves. There's nothing we can do here. We're just here to wait and to work, which when you think about it, you know, they're killing their workforce. <laughs> Why are they shooting everybody? Come on. Well, it, it, they can get some more pretty easily, it seems. Yeah, I so. guess they can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's just, it's it's tough to even contemplate. And when you think about it, you know, not much has changed. No. Um, some, some stuff literally didn't change. At the time that the documentary had wrapped, um, they, the only thing that had changed is that they'd added two more guard towers to the yard in uh, in Attica. Um, eventually, indirectly, uh, the New York State Department of Corrections did make some changes. They in- instituted a grievance procedure in which inmates could, you know, bring up concerns or grievances um, against policy violations by staff members. Um, and they also started a program where 
uh, somebody from the prison, like the warden or his representatives would meet with um, a representative elected by the inmates, like a prisoner rep uh, to talk about issues. And also they allowed um, packages to be received as well. Okay. Yeah. That's some things. Well, I wonder like, you know, on paper, some of that sounds nice. I wonder how effective that's been. Furthermore, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know because uh, you know if you watch uh, something like a documentary like Thirteenth, uh, like you'll see how much the prison population has increased uh, in just in just the last few years, yeah. uh, much less from the seventies, and um, how that all feeds into um, this prison industrial complex. We haven't. <laughs> this is all before uh, the crime bill, even, and the war on drugs. Like the war on drugs hasn't even begun yet. It's just like a gleam in some. Uh, you know, in some uh, conservative shithead's uh, eye. Uh, and after that, and I say conservative, but of course, you know, one of the authors of the 1994 crime bill was uh, Mr. Joseph Robinette Biden. Right. Uh, instituting legislature that would put people away for unprecedented amount of time, uh, amounts of time uh, for, for nothing. I mean, because let's be honest, like a lot of these guys in Attica, they're not, they're not angels. You know, they're, they're people who are, serving time, you know, for things that they have done and are trying to be rehabilitated. But now we can just throw, uh, you know, somebody who had some weed on them in prison Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, start, start up, start up on that metal work. Right. Yeah. And as you said, it's like, this doesn't even seem like in the first place, it was the, the most effective way to rehabilitate someone, but now it's just compounded and compounded. And you know what? That some of those uh, some of those uh, little reforms you mentioned do actually sound like kind of the perfect like liberal reform of like <laughs> we pass a resolution where we will talk to you. You can tell us if you have a problem. Let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Will something happen? I don't know, but you can, you can tell us. We'll we got a Feel suggestion heard. box. You know. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> there are a lot of. Things that led to uh, this and to where we are right now. Something that really struck me about the doc was, I can't remember who it was, but somebody made the point that the authorities who set this up knew that, you know, they couldn't survive in this prison. Like if you throw Oswald in there, you know, he wouldn't last a day in this environment that these guys have created. They just created this hornet's nest that they have to poke with a stick every once in a while. So... Yeah, it's just, it's crazy, and it seems like the wrong way to go about uh, this. Yeah, no kidding. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> the doc closes with um, footage of the Har- Harlem Funeral March, which was a nonviolent protest that was organized uh, in the wake of uh, the people that died in Attica, and it's just like a very reminiscent of some of the things that you've seen today, protests and marches, um, people marching from Attica or, or through Harlem to... Um, to honor the the victims of uh, the assault. Yeah, that was it was pretty powerful, I would say. Um obviously there's I don't know, it does leave you a bit feeling like and I guess this will be a theme with talking about the Star Trek episode is like when is this when when does it change or how does it change or can it ever? Yeah. 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 Well, uh let's let's talk about that Star Trek episode, but first uh we're going to take a quick break. For a word from our sponsors, we'll be back with more backtracking. Hi, I'm Mikan Hana. And I'm Caliban. And we're the hosts of the Sailor Noob Podcast. I'm the expert. And I'm the noob. You're talking into the wrong end of the microphone. Aye, aye. Okay. Every week we watch a new episode of Sailor Moon and learn about monsters, fashion, food, culture, and of course, the Sailor Warrior of Love and Justice Sailor Moon. All right, now, what is her rank? Is she an admiral or a rear admiral? Okay, shh, shh. The ad's almost over. We're a couple of magical people, and every week we moon prison power make up a new episode. Better her midships. Study as she goes. Please stop that. Sailor Noob is available every Friday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Shiver me timbers. <laughs> All right, we're back. It's time to talk about the Trek side of this equation. You know, Trek is no stranger to problem stories, that is, stories that examine societal issues like racism, discrimination, and class prejudice. 
Trek takes advantage of its sci-fi setting to couch those issues in metaphor, meaning that week after week we're seeing aliens discriminate against other aliens over alien distinctions of race, creed, gender, religion, and so on. But Star Trek Deep Space Nine was a different kind of show, one that was designated specifically to examine social issues without couching them behind too many layers of metaphor, but in a more direct and explicit way. And DS9 got about as explicit as it could get with the 1995 two-part episode, Past Tense 1 and 2. A transporter accident. The beam was redirected through time, not space. Redirected where? Not where. When. Sends the crew three centuries back in time. This is not the Earth we're used to, Doctor. Into the heart of a full-scale revolution. This place is about to explode. But getting home may mean rewriting history. That's enough! On the next Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Trapped in Earth's past. I thought we were on the same side here. Think again. Cisco's mission is to save the future. You don't know what any of this is about, do you? But in order to keep history from being altered... Those hostages aren't going anywhere until we get what we want. We move in at 0500. Will he be forced to sacrifice himself? On the next Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I've seen Past Tense yeah. probably a dozen times now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I rewatched it, but I didn't need to rewatch it. Yeah. Uh, but I was thinking about it. Watch. Yeah, before this, like, I, should I even rewatch it? And I was like, no, I probably should rewatch it. And I'm glad I did because uh, it's still good. And goddamn, it's, <laughs> it's just more. <laughs> It's more relevant than ever. Yeah, I remember every time I watch it, it's like every few years or so, I'm like, wow, more relevant than ever. And then I watch yep. it again, I'm like, wow, more relevant than ever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know when it – well, maybe in 2028 will it be relevant? Probably. 2028? 20, yeah, like after we pass the date or something, you know, like yeah. it'll probably still feel very recent and real, yeah. Yeah. I think the first time that I – um, had talked. I talked about this on on a podcast. Was for the second season of Enterprising Individuals, which was in February of 2017. So we were like, "All right, here we go. We're at the top of the of the flume ride here." You know, Trump had just uh, taken office and sworn right. in, and it's like, "Okay, where are we gonna where are we gonna go with this?" And it was awfully predictable, <laughs> but. Not that predictable. I think we exceeded the uh, the limits of predictability here in terms of where we're at. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what is going to happen in the world like the next next week, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the fact that you know, for as and people have said for years that this is prescient in a lot of ways, and it's it's definitely a cautionary tale. But as we open, Cisco is giving his log and talking about going to this conference on earth and then he's going to see his sister in portland i thought that was like oh well there you go that's the little that's the little artist remark that tells us no no this actually did fall through a warp from the future portland's still there you know (laughs) yeah that's true it does still exist that's true (laughs) but uh, and i guess there's black people there just assuming that he's related to her uh, yeah blood so that's that's all good but that's good boy yeah (laughs) I didn't even this, notice that one. That's yeah, good good catch. Yeah. Um this episode um uh, or the both of these episodes, I guess, are really you know, they're really a detour. I mentioned in my intro about how they can go any time of the week to a planet where blue people are fighting red people and we're supposed to kind of get it or whatever. Or like in Rick and Morty, um Oh, we have spiral nipples and they have pointy nipples or something. Kill them. Sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this is this gets rid of all that and just goes, no, we're, it's on Earth. It's in the future. It's about it's a 95 to like 2024. So it's about, it's about 30 years or so in, in the future that they were writing it. Now it's, you know, four years in our future. And they're not holding back. And they're doing no. that thing where people in the 90s thought that in 25 years we we'd have you know crazy computer consoles or at least they don't do flying cars or whatever it's still pretty recognizable as their time but yeah i don't know it's it's bold of them to just kind of do not a sci-fi story it's just basically a modern you know contemporary tale 
Yeah, totally. Yeah, they're stuck there, and it it's it feel it does still feel very current. Um, even even down to just like the um, the production, I think is really good in this too. Where like mm-hmm. you know they're kind of predicting now, and obviously there's a lot of stuff that is hokey or whatever. But I I I kind of love it. Like it, it's yeah. it's just like it fits in very well, but it's not like over the top. Just except for the fact that it's like okay, they they call it the net or something, but yeah, yeah, I love that. And then of course, mixed with just the actual um, uh, story is obviously very grounded and very real. Well, we definitely called it the net back then. I can confirm that. <laughs> well, the one thing that they you know they have the thing where it's like, oh, I'm an internet TV baron or whatever. Like everybody was convinced that. You know, we'd watch TV on the internet, which I guess we absolutely we do, do. Yeah, <laughs> in a lot of ways, but we don't say that though. You know, and there there aren't yeah, channels yeah, yeah. like the internet would destroy channels. Um, that he should have worked for a media conglomerate. You know what I mean? Like I'm a I'm a Viacom vice president or something like that. Yeah, that kind of thing doesn't. It, yeah, it's like it doesn't feel like they failed to predict something though. You know, it just feels like okay, yeah. sub channel for app or whatever, and yeah, you right. got it. They they got yeah. it. It's it's a better it, prediction than like the eugenics wars or something. <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, that's true. Um, and of course, social media, in a way, they, they didn't have that concept, is very important to the climax. Um, they don't really bring it in until the climax. I think they mention, you know, very like in the middle of the second episode that one of the reasons that Gabriel Bell was so important is not because he was this hero, but because he was able to like hack and get them back on the net so that they could, you know, get their stories out there because people were seeing them like the real life Attica prison riot as just animals and people that weren't worth their time. And so people, you know, giving their testimonials and going on and saying, you know, I'm just like you, I have family, you know, I had a job and it didn't work out and now I'm stuck in this like hell hole. And that's all we want is just to be treated like people. Um, that was really important to, to the resolution of it. Yeah. I can, I can totally see, um, like the, in the universe, like people, well, I guess they do show people outside of this, but like, you know, like I could totally see the conversation of like the politician going to visit the sanctuary districts and, yeah. and people being like, this is just a PR stunt. Everything's fine in there. Oh, uh, see now they should have done. Yeah. The spin is, is something that they didn't, uh, didn't dig into either which of course is 90 percent of our waking life now is just hearing people's mm-hmm. spin and lies about things that we are watching happening we got but they a do have a little that... bit of the the party you know yeah that's true and they, they have the they have the party where they, the, the neo trotskys oh no it's not going to be that that's not what that's not what it's going to be on the other side it's not gonna be left. <laughs> yeah yeah left wing's not going to be the problem here bring on the neo trotskys please yeah yeah, but there's, there's a suggestion of something, at least, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There's the scene where um, uh, the uh, representative of the government, uh, played by Deborah Van Valkenburg from The Warriors. So oh. does she ever get tired of being in post-apocalyptic settings? I don't know. So but, just uh, stick to what you know, I guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> she, But she's talking to the governor. And she's like, no, no, I think we can deal with them. Oh, no. Okay, sir. No, they're going to send the troops in. You know, it must have been a lot of restraint to not say like, uh, you know, okay, Mr. Rockefeller. Yeah, yeah. It was (laughs) when they were like, because they said somewhere, right, that that was the influence for this or like. Yeah, Ira Bear. Okay. Ira Stephen Bear specifically said it was it was the um, the the Attica prison riots was the um, uh, inspiration for the Bell riots. And then also um, specifically the crackdown on. Uh, homeless populations in LA in the nineties, you know, they did two big things. Well, first of all, Reagan threw uh, all the patients out of the um, sanitariums and and asylums. So they became homeless. And then now you've got all these homeless encampments in like Santa Monica and stuff. And so bear would drive to work and see, you know, just teams of police, just, you know, beating people out of these camps and getting rid of them and thought, well, we got to do something about that. Yeah, because so much of it when I was, it was actually when I was watching Attica and being like, oh, okay, oh my God, yeah, they they really like, really borrowed from this in, in a good way, you know, like they, because it, like this, this is one of the most real feeling stories in Star Trek, um, not just because of the setting, but because of how, how much I feel like they connected it with, 
with reality. So it it just rings true mm-hmm. so much more, I think. Yeah. Than sometimes where it's like we go to the racism planet and <laughs> tell them like, yeah. can't we all yeah. just get along? You know, like this right, dealt with right. actual like yeah, like some of the systems and stuff like that. Yeah, I think, and it doesn't like you know, Dax it gets on AOL or whatever and uh, <laughs> orders her uh, new uh, ID. But yeah, the internet, and then of course there's a the thing at the end. But the internet's not a huge part of this. Uh, the internet might have been the worst thing that ever happened to us, like human civilization. Wow. Like we wouldn't be we wouldn't be talking to each other. People wouldn't be listening to us. But I'd, I'd trade that for like not <laughs> concentrating and 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 ter- uh, uh, distilling into weapons grade uh the amount of hate and like just the the online communities that would have just been solitary cranks that you kind of you know cross the street when you see to like now they're they've got tiki torches and yeah. and, and they and they all think that they have a point whereas before I hope maybe that crazy guy maybe if he got his opportunity to go for it he would but maybe he'd wonder if he, he was right or not and now every day all these crazy people have and I'm sorry to be ableist, but I, these guys are nuts. They they just have a bunch of people telling them, no, no, you're right, bro. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely bro. Uh, you know, you, yeah, you're totally right. We're being replaced and yeah. all this bullshit. And, yeah, that, and that's so much easier to spread, I feel like. And just, I guess, how how much easier it's been made to, like, target people, like, from uh, the, the government's perspective. Or even, even, like, I don't know, the way, like, brands... <laughs> kind of infect our lives through social media too kind of i don't know all of it is kind of it it uh, flattens you a bit i think yeah and when you think about the kind of it's it's really sucks because when you think about the kind of um computer dystopia that you know some people live in in movies and tv where the government's watching you you know the view screens in 1984 the truth is is that the government doesn't know anything about computers and shit you know like they're People are using, you know, extremist groups are using things like Facebook and Instagram, you know, to to meet and to communicate and do stuff. You know, Reddit has become this breeding ground for white supremacy, you know, for racist groups, for anti-government groups. And the feds can't find these guys. They can't. They don't know shit because they're they're not like a 14 year old kid. You know what I mean? We need to like a squad of 14 year old kids <laughs> that we like turn to into government agents to go in and infiltrate this, yeah. this stuff. Like they, they don't, they can't find these communities. They don't know how to stop these communities. And then the whole 1984 thing, if we give them the education and the ability to find these communities, then they're going to go find communities that don't need to be regulated. Do you know what I mean? They're going to abuse they, the government abuses all power that we give it, no matter what, what realm it uh, exists in or resides in. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the nature of government is to abuse power. <laughs> yeah, so far I think yeah. <laughs> one one way I know that the internet and maybe and technology has ruined our lives is because you know back in the day you could just walk over to someone's house and knock on the door, see if they were home, and if they wanted to hang out. Not, not nowadays. You, now you can't do it's that. Like, yeah. Well, nowadays it's like. Who the fuck's at my door? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I, I've heard that plenty of times, and I'm like, "Who is that? I don't want anybody to to talk to me." No one should be uh, near my door. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this. Uh, I mean, we could just go beat by beat through this episode, but I like the fact that real early on we get to see Dick Miller, one of my favorite characters. Oh my actors, god! Yeah. Oh my god! I love him. Perfect for this character who is the real. He's the real salt of the earth guy. You know, he's got a foot in both worlds because he's part of the of the organization. But he's, you know, he's the lowest part. And he's just this old crabby guy who is disillusioned. And putting putting those words in the mouth of Dick Miller is great. And then seeing him at the end go, all right, come on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you guys out of here. You know, him being the guy that yeah. lends a hand at the end is, is really great. Yeah, one thing I liked about his character is that and I mean, if if we're comparing it to, like, Attica or, like, anything like that, th- there's obviously, like, people in these positions who, like, most of them are, are awful. But I like, I like actually, that it kind of shows that, like, the, like, result of a lot of what happens to people is because, like, that's just kind of, like, everyone is kind of 
the conditions that everyone are, are in, you know? Yeah. So like some of these people who are, have these jobs shouldn't, and they're just kind of like, you know, they have, they have a function they need to serve and, and that's to abuse the, the, uh, inmates, you know? So, yeah. Uh, he's the, he's he starts as the good guy that's not not doing anything. Yeah, about you, it, you know. Just like having him as sort of like the good one, you I guess you at least get a, or or even his his buddy is like you kind of at least get an insight into that. Though I guess they could have they could have been a little more villainous. Yeah, but they but they didn't have to be villains. And in fact, you know, we talk, we talk big talk about the cops and stuff, but I don't think a lot of these cops are villains. I mean, we know that. And it's becoming more and more clear how just shot through all, uh, so to speak, all uh, police departments are with, you know, racists and white supremacists. But a lot of these guys are just like, I need this job. I need this job. Are you kidding me? And if I have to go yell at somebody or chase somebody that I don't know and I guess care about, I guess I'm not going to think too hard about that. And the young guard is is kind of like that. It's just like, you know, I, I got away from kids he doesn't say that explicitly. It's just sort of set up and you start to understand that like in this world where <laughs> jobs are a real premium, he's like, look, if I have to just take these anarchists, I like how Dick Miller's like, what are you, an anarchist? And it's like, let's update that. What What are you, Antifa? <laughs> Get out of here in your pajamas. Yeah, we'll do we'll do a, a re-release when for the, the Blu-ray release eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that um, – the, the division here was great. I actually think that the kind of goofy stuff with O'Brien and uh, and Kira, you could probably cut a, cut cut all that from the episode. <laughs> this, you could. This could probably be like this could be an hour if you'd cut all that, but it's it's fine. I don't mind but, it. I don't mind it. But they but they pick their people great because who they send down because you know um, Cisco goes down, Bashir goes down, and and Dax goes down, and Cisco and Bashir get picked up and they get put into this system and. It's. I don't think they do enough with Cisco being black because remember this is 2024. We have not solved racism. That would no, be a problem. No. But then, but also Bashir is. Uh, he has a British accent, and you know if you look close enough, he's not you know totally white. And so they don't do a lot with that. But if this happened now, like if these guys got picked up by D uh, by ICE, they just deport them. But. Right away, this really nice black lady's like, "Okay, let's get you into the system. Let's get you. Let's get you checked out. Let's get your papers." Um, I know that this is supposed to be a um, a dystopia of uh, bureaucracy as well, but this little office seems to be working pretty well. Now they are just shuffling them into a hole from which they may never yes. escape. But <laughs> but in Trump's America, we would just shoot them out of a cannon over the over the border <laughs> wall, and then immediately uh, when. This somebody finds Dax. It's like, let me help you, beautiful white lady, and oh, yeah, she, yeah. she gets everything she needs right away. It works Although perfect, I have to, yeah. uh, I have to say that uh, it was pointed out to me that Dax is pretty good at this. Like she immediately yes. uh, is like, oh, oh, thanks for helping me. Yeah, and then she just lets this this guy talk, you know, and just lets him make all the assumptions that he needs to make. And also knowing Dax's character, this isn't the first time she's woken up at a sub- subway station, right? <laughs> like she's, I think oh, she's sure. been in situations like this before. Well, plenty of uh, Curzon. I gotta find Core. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so um, you know, Dax, Dax was born in uh, 2018, so you know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh the the she's out there somewhere. Been there yeah. for a while, a lot of life experience that I feel like actually I feel like it's one of those things where like the the D&D character sheet for Dax is probably like most of these things are pretty maxed out now. It's like a folder. <laughs> yeah. It's like a sheaf of paper. Yeah. Kind of like a, yeah. a Swiss army person. So I think it's it's that's a really important part of the story, although she doesn't really do much in the second episode. But like it's an important part to see her navigating the other side of this. You know, she's an alien, but using her her passing privilege here to just just, you know, actually navigate the the safety net that does exist for some people, the right people Um and they send her money and like a new ID. Yeah, which I thought was was great. <laughs> yeah, I love that you see that because like, like she did nothing different than them. Just woke up in a different p- p- part, you know, yep. looking different. She's yeah, born on Third Street subway station. Yeah, yep. that's great. Um, 
finds a CEO that had a cool, sweet tribal tattoo from the oh, 90s. Oh, amazing, yeah. <laughs> Which, then I was wondering, like, wait, how old is this guy? Because he definitely would have had a tribal tat in the 90s, but this is, like, 2025, so he's, like, pushing 50 or, like, in his 50s. He looks good. Yeah, he's got the... Yeah, it looks good. He's got but the again, Paul that's Rudd the, uh, serum. The Paul Rudd, yeah. <laughs> that's the effect of privilege, though, yeah. Um, oh, boy. Um... So they get thrown into the into the sanctuary. Love that. That's real good too. Yeah, um, yeah. Where, and like I said before, the bureaucracy is real nice on the front, and then, oh no, we just watch out for ghosts. It's like what? What the fuck? What are you talking about? <laughs> Actually, the, you know what? The stuff you're mentioning now to to me makes me think that this isn't the this this actually predicts that Biden wins the election. Because we'll still oh, have so? all the same awful shit as we do now, but it'll be we'll be nice about it. Yeah, and, and like we won't mention race, but like, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's uh, you, you're putting it in perspective <laughs> to me now, actually. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, and it's of course they could have projected forward, but they don't even deal with the fact that it would be an election year. I guess um, that would be great though if there were like people in this talking about like I don't know. <laughs> like trying to talk about the election, the electoral politics, you know, like the people in the sanctuary yeah. districts, like how do we vote ourselves out of here? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. We're going to vote with our hands. Yeah. Uh, although Dick Miller does mention the 99 Yankees, uh, which the writers of DS9 had have way, no way to know that they won the World Series, swept the Braves that year. But I mean, it's the Yankees. Probably a good bet. Yeah. Yep. No, that's an easy that's an easy one. No points for that. I think that um, it's it's interesting to note that when they wrote this in the 90s, you know, they created this character, this idea of Gabriel Bell, who would be thought of as a hero and uh, because he was somebody who who led the riots and was martyred. But in reality, the names that are on our lips now are people who didn't even make it to the party. You know, they were martyred before the movement even started. Oh, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I mean, they on on their little AOL machine, maybe they could have, you know, hashtag justice for Gabriel Bell, like after the riots happen. But, you know, these our movements are in response to two things. Yeah. I happened. wonder I wonder if there was like, I don't know. I wonder if they had even considered that, you know, I guess they were yeah. just thinking of like probably uh, they were probably crafting it based on like famous you know, civil rights figures or something like that. You know, we mm-hmm. want him to yeah. like kind of take the place of someone who would have led a movement. And so, yeah. yeah. Do you think we, we should talk about that? Do you think that, um, that Cisco has disrupted things, has made a new timeline here or was, <laughs> was he always Gabriel Bell? Because Cisco's familiar with Gabriel Bell. He read about him in the history books. So you think if there was a picture of him, He'd be like, this guy looks kind of like uh, me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's probably best not to think about it. But uh... Because the original Gabriel Bell, presumably, in the two seconds we see him, is is a noble guy. You know, he runs to their defense and then is stabbed and murdered by Arby's hat guy, who becomes the comedy character in the second yeah. episode. What? <laughs> I, I love this guy, actually. <laughs> DC, yeah. He's, he, uh, he's got a great... Uh... I don't know, like attitude, '90s attitude about him. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with his voice? Because he he's talks so weird, and the accent is just goes nowhere. You can't place that accent anywhere. He's just really going for it, I guess. Is he <laughs> is he in anything else? Like maybe it just feels like this is my big break. I'm going to be the mo- I, most I think, memorable character. Yeah, I think you're you're partially right. There is a guy named Frank Military, which is a great name. Oh wow. And- <laughs> he was a screenwriter. Um, he wrote on Miami Vice, I guess, for a while, and then had also dabbled in acting. So this is like, yeah, this is him. I got my big DS, my Star Trek two parter, and I'm gonna really go for it. Yeah, there was, there's definitely like potential for him to get more roles as like a bully. <laughs> yeah, this. just that character specifically. Yeah, asshole bully from the '90s. Um. I think uh, it's just as far in terms of um, talking about like writing to the era, um, no one has a cell phone in this. And even in 1995, I feel like yeah, there there were cell phones. I guess I was thinking like if you're kind of locked away here, like, you know, it'd be like not as much like being in prison, but like maybe you wouldn't have access. But 
but there sure. would still be people who would get a hold of them, you know? Oh, t- yeah, there's a- cell phones in prison, yeah. Like, um, TV guy would have, a, you know, offer Dex his phone or she would, they would send her a phone from the internet or something. Um, cause the whole time she's just like, I have to find my friends, but she's got no real way to do that. And she's got a computer, but Google isn't really a thing in, in the mid nineties. So nobody has thought to write that she could, you know, Google for information or something like that. So yeah, that, she's just kind of stuck hanging out with this TV guy. That would change Until the story, I guess a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, until somebody at the party like randomly mentioned something about the the camps or something like that, and she's like, "Oh, I should check the camp." It's like, "Yeah, Dax, you should." The, mm, you know, doesn't it kind of thinking about it now? It, it does kind of remind me of, or like maybe it's a thing that that they couldn't have predicted now because now it's like, you know, just today, I, you know, you see a video of a, an unmarked van abducting people or whatever. And mm-hmm. it's like we see crazy videos like this all the time of just like this yeah. most insane level of, of violence. And it's like it's just happening constantly, you know, whereas like the the point of the end of this episode is like, well, people will see this and then change will happen. You know? Yeah. I think that that's what they're going off of. Yeah. Which but... it feels like we're seeing this now and it's like, well, <sighs> stuff's still going on. <clears throat> But yeah, it's change. It's changing things for some people, but it, yeah. other people, it's just it doesn't doesn't matter at all. Yeah. I guess reality is more of a, a process of than this episode <laughs> leaves it on. You know, yeah, it's a big fucking process. Um, did you see that video of the guy who went up to one of the lines of cops in Portland and they just started wailing on him? But like, he's just not. He's just yes. like this huge guy. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like fucking Luke Cage has shown up at the at the protest. That, guy was, that guy's sick. <laughs> that was that's the Gabriel Bell of our time. <laughs> oh my god, I can't even think of who the Gabriel Bell would be. I guess we got a couple years to f- find out. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, I guess we do. Um, uh. Yeah, uh, Unicorn Riot. I don't know. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So Gabriel Bell is killed, and then I don't know if he would have taken hostages or not. <laughs> what the history book says, but uh, yeah, Cisco's like, well, we got to take hostages. Um, yeah, and and I think that that's when you think about a Starfleet captain, you think about a Federation citizen. That's a that's a big jump. If anybody, if any character on any Star Trek show is going to do it, it's Archer. I mean, it's Cisco, <laughs> but. But, yeah, that's a big step. When I think about the future and the Federation and the fact that even this show, which is a good exploration of the issues, of course it's become weirdly prescient. But at the end of it, you know, that once again, Bashir's like, how'd it get so bad? And nobody's got an answer, you know, because we, we don't know. We have general answers. But I just feel like there, in my head canon, there's some point in the Federation's history where they just took everybody into a room and did something to their brains and they came out and was like, oh, I've got 200% more empathy now. Do you know what mm. I mean? I don't know what has to change about the human animal, you know, as designed to make us get to a point like that. Because it just doesn't seem to be working, Empathy's you know? Empathy is probably a big key. Um, <sighs> yeah. Definitely, like, well, I I do like, I do like, at first, I back in the day, I used to think, like, that it was kind of a weak answer of like because they've forgotten how to care, you know. Because I was like, it yeah, doesn't yeah, it doesn't give you a specific answer, but then you do see, like, I like you see the the guards and you see the the woman who works there, like in the in the office, and they. Oh, I loved her story about how there was that one person that she met that sort of just kind of broke her, where it was like this woman couldn't even feed her child, and so she's like, I just let her go in, and then after that, I was like. I don't really care anymore. I'm just sort of like just pushing papers. So while I used to think that was a bad answer, I actually think it mirrors reality a little bit just because I think like for a lot of people, like myself included, a lot of times like the world we live in just grinds you down and it flattens Mm. you and it like sometimes forces you to like not want to engage with anything, you know, like especially me growing. I grew up like grew up through you know the war in iraq the financial yeah. crisis and all this stuff and it, and it's just like wow like everything is so terrible you know there's people getting killed by the police in the streets 
all the time. So it's just, it's so overwhelming and, yeah. and, you know, and you're like, but I, and I still have to go to work <laughs> and I, and then I <laughs> yeah. still have to engage with people who think like it's all a liberal conspiracy, uh, yeah. like coronavirus is a liberal conspiracy or something, you know? So it's just like, uh, it's just, you know, I, I, I think that answer, while it's not like the answer, I think it does get at something, you know, it's, it's, it's not like the people specifically are to blame, but like, I do think. Yeah, like the world kind of grinds you down and you do at times forget how to care or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah, I mean it's they look they look at it or, or try to explain it that way, but I also liked and I thought it was a great bit of dialogue about how they give us a view of it through Bashir's eyes in a very concrete way because he's uh a doctor, you know, he's a he's a medical professional, so he's looking at it like this guy over here, he's got schizophrenia. They can treat schizophrenia right now, and they're not yeah. even doing it. Like, I don't need, like, a wand or something. Like, they have problems that they can fix. We're not talking about food shortages or World War Three or Khan or something. Like, they can take care of these problems, and they're not doing it, which is absolutely true of our real world right now today. Yeah, with a lot of our issues, yeah, we have the means to end many of the world's problems, but... Yeah. Yeah. So I just think it's a really big move for somebody from an enlightened society like Cisco who's like, all right, give me that gun. Let's do this. But the construction of the story is weird because they set up that there is – because I think you know in the 90s you think of like what's going to get things changed. Somebody's going to die. There's going to be some kind of like incident. So that we know that we have to follow that and then Cisco becomes that. But it isn't really the taking of the hostages necessarily that is – the most important part it is the part that i think is kind of downplayed which is him hacking the computer so people on the outside can see the people on the inside do you know what i mean yeah yeah and by the end it's not like they stop the massacre from happening like hundreds of people still die like it's it's terrible but you know it's just like it's a weird thing i think for a starfleet captain to be like yeah we got to do this this is definitely what we, have, what we have to do and the way they depict the riot is you know, there's – look, these people are hungry. They're desperate and so they get out of line and they start beating up the guards. I understand it makes sense. But our own real world version of this is just an endless story of protesters showing up to a protest to peaceably protest and mm-hmm. then getting the shit kicked out of them by the cops and then responding – like you would when you're getting tear gassed and beaten by the cops, which is to fight back. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's it it does yeah as an analog, it's like a little different. But I do like, you know, Arby's hat guy says it himself, where he's like he says the same thing that they say in the Attica documentary, which is like these conditions created this, and I, yeah. I think that goes like, and I think that is true. Like that also speaks to when people are like. Um, oh, like, oh, it's awful what, what happened with these riots. Like, these yeah. businesses were destroyed. Oh, my goodness. And it's like, yeah, it really sucks that the police uh, escalated and created that situation. Yeah, and that, um, you know, uh, some a third column would uh, come in and um, be inciting violence, too, in, in the background. Yeah. Um, they didn't predict... That not that they have to predict on Star Trek, but they didn't predict predict that the police would be a fucking army. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just Dick Miller. <laughs> you know, it's just Dick Miller in a jumpsuit, and they take a shotgun away. And there's a couple shots at the end when you get the idea that shit's really going to go down. Like when when the cops from uh, RoboCop, you know, the OCP cops, yeah, come yeah, in. yeah. They don't have RoboCop, but yeah, and then they come in and start killing everybody. But like, they didn't predict that. Like from the beginning, it would we'd be fighting against sci-fi police basically and armor <laughs> i mean it would have worked well for star trek you know yeah that's uh, true yeah i was gonna say that i i liked cisco like taking the hostages i kind of liked that it like humanized that because that was something that was stuck out in the attica documentary too was like because that's something you can say oh, oh they took hostages they're they're mistreating yeah. they're killing them we got to go down in there and and gun them down you know but it's like there's i don't know that that's something that Bashir's giving people insulin and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, you just you see, not quite the same thing. I don't know. Sometimes Star Trek dabbles in that, where it's like 
sometimes like hostage taking or like, you know, these acts that are, you know, bad are, you know, there's like times where things are necessary. Like they, they do that sometimes when they talk about like terrorism and stuff like that too, you know, yeah, especially mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. Kira. And, and so I like that they did that. And I like that even though it's, he's a little goofy. I liked uh, that at the end, like our Ar- Arby's hat guy <laughs> was kind of like a, <laughs> sympathized with by the end he like is like a good guy by the end of it i think yeah even though he killed someone (laughs) he did stab a guy for some food yeah um the second half of the of this the second episode is kind of like a a dog day afternoon situation have you seen dog day uh yes yeah doesn't that reference attica yeah yeah okay (laughs) yeah yeah. scene where the guy (laughs) screams attica yeah yeah there we go yeah yes Uh, yes which is, you know, is is a is a crappy uh, situation <laughs> to be in as well. But you never want to um, be in a dog day afternoon situation. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's interesting that, and very similarly in dog day afternoon, um, John Cazal and uh, and uh, um, Pacino aren't like bad. You know, they aren't mean or or uh, with the hostages. You know, once the siege sets in, they're just you know the hostages like hear their stories and they're, they become friends and so, and sympathetic to each other. So it's kind of a similar thing there too. It actually, so it kind of, I mean, I guess he's just kind of like aggressive to RB hat guy most of the time, but um, the RB hat guy to me shows the need to like, he's just kind of like chaotic, right? He's just like yeah, yeah, pissed yeah. living in here and, and Cisco kind of represents like, like, the need to like, you can kind of capture that energy and like, and make it positive in a way, you know? Yeah. And I think that he, uh, he's frustrated, but I I also think that he, you know, is a, is a reader of people and he realizes that this guy will respond to this. You know, if I, if I challenge him and, you know, and make him respect me, but also, you know, we'll, we'll sort of sidle up to each other with like sports references and, and things like that. I, yeah. I need to, cause if I let this guy go, like you said, yeah, he's just he, an agent of chaos. He, if I let this guy go, there's going to be rapes. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. He would have just so. become the Joker. And <laughs> yeah, he would. <laughs> yep. Cause he, yeah, <laughs> he lives in a society. Um, we get, I, I think it's interesting. And I think it's of note that written by white guys in the nineties. Um, it's still kind of a white guy that gets us through this. Um, we haven't talked at all about Webb. Uh, the guy who's just a white father with a white son and daughter and and presumably wife, uh, who's just a just a guy, you know, he's just just a normal guy. Look at just uh, you know, I'm just another guy. Yeah, uh, and it's and it's a white guy, the TV guy, who is convinced by a white lady to to help out, you know, and lend them the the, the airtime or whatever. So I just don't know why we couldn't have put more minority figures at the front of it. Just because you have Cisco doesn't mean that everybody can be white. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess I I did kind of like that it was like he was kind of like this extremely privileged individual. You know, he's like a current, <laughs> you know, he's like a billionaire or whatever. And, a Bezos, yeah. And so I, I guess I kind of like that it was like they harnessed his power, you know. But, yeah. So I, I, I like that element of it. I mean, and much cool. much hay is made out of Bell's role and, and his death, but, you know, Webb dies too. And he's the main guy who's like negotiating with um, the uh, governor's representative, and he he would have been the the public face of this as much as as Bell was. Oh, Webb, right? I yeah. I was thinking of uh, the uh, the tech dude. My bad. Oh, right. Yeah, but yeah, I'm saying like Webb um, and his and his son. Which <laughs> there's a great scene that you don't understand the context of until you see it again, but it's where he says goodbye to his kid the whole time his kid is going around he's worried about him and then he's like well i don't really want you around because arby hat guy is going crazy but at the end he's like okay go go be with your family you know and yeah and i'll i'll join you later but he knows he's gonna die at that point yeah i i guess I, I liked this character and i liked that it it shows that like like i've I, like I think they could have made more to do about the race, obviously, but I do like that it shows that it's like this is a cross, you know, race <laughs> issue. Um, yeah, right. but yeah, but at that point, the '90s guys are writing with like 24th century head because in 2024 it would still be an issue hugely. Yes, uh, Webb played, of course, by Bill Smitrovich, who is a um, longtime character actor. You know, one of one of those guys. Um, 
But but at the end of that scene, he says goodbye. It's great. Kid starts to walk out. And then old BC's got to get it. Hey, kid, take my gross hat. <laughs> I, like, yeah. Look, <laughs> I can't help it. I, I just thought it was so fun. <laughs> like that person is absolutely a person who would ruin moments in real life but in this scripted show like does he have to ruin that moment <laughs> it, it's so insane that i love it because yeah. it was like no real connection with this guy um <laughs> i don't know yeah i liked it just because it was like maybe maybe it's not good necessarily but like in such a serious episode and you have this like real goofy guy <laughs> i don't know yeah i I was. I think they were thinking like this is heavy. Like we need something. So we got we got Frank Military and we got Clint Howard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my. Surprise! Gosh. It's Clint Howard. Clint Howard. Yeah. <laughs> a pair of episodes that the first episode is very sensitive to mental illness, and the second one has Clint Howard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's where I draw the line. I like the RB hat guy, but I think Clint Howard was a little much. A, a Howard too far. Yeah. What's up with him? What's up with Clint Howard? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, he's just in it. I mean, obviously, uh, one of the earliest guest stars on Trek. He was in the first production episode of Star. He was the first uh, guest star on Trek, technically. So I'm actually kind of surprised that he hasn't been on Trek more. You know, they, they had him on Discovery, obviously, um, in the first season. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. They just were like, who do we get? Oh, let's get Clint Howard. What's he up to? We haven't had him this series. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I and I feel like he was kind of unnecessary. I think he was more unnecessary than uh, Kira and O'Brien. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, it was just because she had to get the communicator from him? Yeah, she had to get the communicator because it would allow her to contact O'Brien and Kira when they came back. So yeah, if you cut Kira, Kira and O'Brien, you can cut Clint Howard and then we just get up. Yeah, we get could have, we could have tightened this up. We could have made this a 45 minute ep probably. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You'd have, I was, I thought a lot about this actually. You would. Okay. So it's all thanks to Armin Shimmerman <laughs> because if Armin Shimmerman wasn't like contracted to be in every episode of the show, you wouldn't need to talk to him at the beginning, which means you don't need a defiant scene, which means you don't need the extra you don't need the extra crew, right? Just have it they wait this is how Voyager would have done it. They wake up, they're on the streets of San Francisco, right? Uh, Not the song. Yeah. And then we just go from there and then a little extra expository dialogue. We were coming to a conference on Earth. Wait. You know, <laughs> did you did you feel did you feel weird when you were beamed? Yeah, something something happened. And later on, we can explain that it's a wormhole, but they don't have any contact with the future until the last second where one of their communicators, like, you know, sp- sparks to life. And it's like, this is O'Brien. I think we've got a lock on you. And they get them out of there. No problem. Um, Wait, so Armin Shimmerman has to be in every episode? <laughs> um, I, I don't exactly know how TV contracts work, oh. but I'm fairly certain that as, um, as a feature player or a main cast member, he has like a... Uh, a thing where he has wow. to be in every episode. Because when you think about somebody like Marina Sirtis as Troy, she would disappear for weeks yeah. and not be on there. And I think Armin was very smart and had a good agent when he signed on because he's very often, like, the episode will have nothing to do with Quark or Ferengi, but there'll be, a, like, a tag at the beginning or end where they're in Quarks and it's just like, do a little joke and then no more Quark in the episode. Yeah, I've, got, n- I've noticed that lately watching it, but... uh I just kind of thought it was because they like to use all the characters. For... Don't get that Troy contract. Get that Cork contract. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Stay in work. He ruined everything then. <laughs> yeah, he ruined the whole episode. I think despite that, it's see... still somehow one of the, the best Deep Space Nine episodes. Yeah. Well, we had, we had to see Kira and O'Brien uh, and some hippies interact. So That whatever. was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quick before we wrap it up, can you explain to me what happens at the end? A guy comes in, I forgot. tells everybody that he's that he's Gabriel Bell, right? And so when he disappears, whether or not they find a body, you just go, this guy died in the riots, right? But instead, Dick Miller ushers him and Bashir out, and they take their – he asks for their fake IDs, which would say – well, they're not fake. They would say their names probably because later on Bashir admits that Gabriel Bell, quote-unquote, lied about his name. So he has an ID that doesn't say Gabriel Bell on it. And he says he'll swap those for some of the other casualties. So how do we end up associating that black gentleman who was stabbed to death a couple days ago 
with Gabriel Bell, the guy who was in the riots. Um, word, word of mouth? I don't know. I guess. I have honestly never considered this. <laughs> You know, when you find the the lady uh, who works in the office, like later on when you pull the sheet back and you go, is this him? She's going to be like, no, that's not that's not Hawk from Spencer for Hire. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we Maybe we just needed a scene where he's like, okay, now you'll tell them all I was Gabriel Bell. I guess, yeah. Or um, the fires, um, you know, uh, incinerated Gabriel Bell's face or something like that. So it's like, I guess that's him. Yeah, that could be. I mean, he he technically did die, Gabriel Bell. Yeah, he definitely died. Yeah. So, um, I guess he didn't know anybody else. It, was he a ghost or something? <laughs> like nobody. He had no he, family he or a, support a, structure. He was in a gimme. Yeah. Oh no, no, he would never be a gimme for sure. Do you think that it's possible to do not an exchange necessarily, but a a technology um, addition to this episode? Sure. Or subtraction. And roll on our table of Trek technologies, which we subtract from te- Trek episodes. But in this case, we'll add it because this is the past that we're talking about, our our future, technically. The technologies are phasers, holodecks, tricorders, transporters, warp drives, replicators, communicators, shields, advanced medical technology, and androids. And if we could give one of those to Cisco and Bashir and Dax in their time in the past, it would be... Transporters. If they had access to a personal transporter, well, how would that affect this episode? Yeah, because kind of a transporter messed the whole thing up. Yeah, they could immediately get out of the Sanctuary District. They just go back to the ship, and it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, because they well, still have to it, figure out O'Brien it might be the science. Yeah, <laughs> I think Spock could figure out a way <laughs> to have it beam through time. They'd go live in someone's basement, Bashir. you know, and... <laughs> now, my question is, would they want to leave? Or would they, like, you think, would they stay and help? Yeah, because Cisco, well, Bashir would want to stay and help medically. Cisco knows that they are existing in a uh, a moment that is a crux of history, and it might be important for them to be there. Yeah, but, well, I guess that depends on what you think their philosophy is. Like, because I can't tell, like, does Cisco stick around because he wants to make the timeline Right? Or just because he wants... Well, he also wants to help, right? Because he knows by making the timeline right, we'll get back on track. Starfleet will exist. Yeah. So I guess it's like two and one. Yeah. But... uh, they We, we aren't 100% privy to his thoughts, but he does... You know, when he realizes that Bell was killed, um, I think that does put something in his mind that's like, well, should we do what he... Yeah, did, you know, because we're screwed now and we do see in the future. I did like that there was a, a note in the future when they're talking. Um, O'Brien and Kira are talking to Starfleet Command and Starfleet Command's like, don't go back in time to try to find them. You're going to screw a bunch more stuff up. Kind of a temporal prime directive thing. But then we get a back to the future kind of nod <laughs> where. Yeah. When Gabriel Bell dies in the past, that makes everybody disappear from the photograph in the future, I guess. And so it's like, well, there's no bosses to talk to, so I guess we're going to try this plan. You just gave me – this gave me a good idea for maybe a Star Trek episode or, or a sci-fi movie. I don't know if maybe this ex- existed already, but, like, maybe you get someone who's, like uh, – they're, like, super radical, right? And they, they decide, <laughs> I've got I've got time travel, right, and I can go back in time – and like solve all these issues like in their okay. in their day and age, you know? Sure. And then you have a Starfleet captain who's like their directive they're given is like, you gotta go stop this guy. So it's like yeah. you gotta go chase him through time and like you know, make sure like he doesn't kill Hitler or something like that. <laughs> That's great. Uh I love that. And one of the things I love about doing the dumb, dumb technological exchange on our show is that it always uh, sparks conversation between us, which is always good pod. Uh, I have two thoughts on that. One's a, <laughs> one's a quick one. They they did an, the opposite of that on uh, Doctor Who, uh, where a space racist came back in time to like kill Rosa Parks to stop the civil rights movement in America. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's intense. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. That sounds questionable if that's a good and, idea. Well, I'm not saying Dr. Who wanted to do that. I'm saying they're trying to stop this guy from uh-huh. doing that. 
And then um, when I used to play the Star Trek role-playing game, the uh, Last Unicorn game, we actually had an, an adventure where uh, a, an admiral uh, from Starfleet Intelligence came onto our ship and wanted to use it and wouldn't tell us what, it was, what, what they were doing. And it turns out that they were using our transporter to beam themselves back in time to when our ship had been commanded by this person and their husband was serving and was killed by the Jem Hadar in the past. Oh, wow. And so we had to use the transporter to go back in time and stop them from changing the past in order to do that. That's it, and, yeah. Yeah, and what happened was, <laughs> we ran a kind of a dark Star Trek show, is that we got there right when it was happening. So Jem Hadar are on the ship fighting everybody, and my character decided, if we just kill this guy in the past, there's nobody to save. And so... My character, like, vaporized that guy, like, while this admiral was trying to save them. And, uh, yeah, long story short, uh, it was kind of a we – got, we got in trouble for that <laughs> when we went back to the future. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so, yeah, I'm glad we got there. I mean – So, I think, yeah, your scenario is totally plausible. I think there's a lot of story potential there. Yeah, maybe when you mentioned Rosa Parks, though, I was like, maybe we don't want to pick something that's that – that was my opinion about the Doctor Who episode, mm. but they went for it. All right. They went for I it. I think I've they accidentally ac- stumbled into Doctor Who discourse. <laughs> they actually ended up, well, I don't know if you watch the show, but no. they actually ended up being like instrumental in, um, I guess I should be mad about past tense too, even though it's fictional, but they actually ended up being instrumental in her not giving up her seat. Like she ended up not giving it up because of... The presence, like they were on the bus, which made it full, and they had talked to her about her civil rights work earlier in the day, and kind of inspired her to go. No, I'm not going to give it up. So that, that's I don't worse. know. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. Like everybody seemed to like it, and it's one thing if like you have the doctor, I don't know, meet George Washington and say, oh, maybe you should cross, uh, you know, you sh- you should forge the the uh, Delaware River or something like that. Um, I don't know, for some reason that doesn't bother me, but when the doctor's like, you can do it, Rosa Parks, I feel like it sort of diminishes Rosa Parks a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, okay, I'm good. But this is basically the same thing on past tense, so I don't know what to say. Well, it's not real. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, And yeah. there's so much more going on. Like, I don't know, it, it speaks to a lot of things, I feel like. I guess I haven't seen the Doctor Who episode, but to me it sounds a bit more shallow <laughs> yeah well i wouldn't i wouldn't disagree well anyway uh the conclusion is uh yeah transporter's bad uh if bezos gets his hands on him oh then, no uh, yeah. he'll just rule the world forever so yeah i like the fact that that guy is kind of dumb but basically a positive force in this episode and only a few years later on voyager that guy was ed begley jr and he was a total villain and of course oh, a villain wow. in our in our real world too yeah yeah they kind of looked out i yeah this episode it's Again, with the guards and him, it's like it airs a lot more on the like forgiving side of all of People humanity. People are basically nice, yeah. They yeah. just forgot how to care, yeah. So maybe they it's, forgot how to care, <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's not good. Like maybe it would just be good to have a control. You know what I mean? Like with you've got the maybe you could have the one cop. Well, that's Dick Miller, right? Yeah, I guess, but come full circle. But there's you know, I mean, you should have had one who's just like cannot wait to like beat someone (laughs) he just wants to get him some dims yeah Yeah. oh boy (laughs) we're back into it let's get we gotta get beam us out beam us out of here here we go okay tell people what's coming up in the next episode of backtracking okay so we're going back uh to tng for the next Mm. one and we're watching the episode a matter of perspective which i'm excited about i haven't watched that in a couple years and apparently i didn't know this uh because i haven't seen it but it is uh influenced by Rashomon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah. that's going to be cool. We could do a podcast about Rashomon and all the things that it's inspired oh. in, <laughs> in popular media. We would endless episodes to I'm, talk about. I'm sure, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this the next, next time on Backtracking, uh, Rashomon comes to Star Trek, and we get to dig into that and watch one of the best movies of all time as well. Yeah, I'm excited. I feel kind of bad for not having seen it. So, well, we can't see everything. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You're not a chameleon. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, that's it for this week's backtracking. Thanks for listening, people. If you like the show, please tell a friend. That's the best way to get the word out there, I think. But you can also follow us at at backtracking on Twitter and tell us what you think that we should cover in future episodes. Gooey, tell the people where they can find you online. You can find me over on Twitter at Gooey Fame. And I am at K-A-1-I-B-A-N on Twitter. And uh, Gooey and I were talking about this before we heated the mics up, but on my podcast, the Just Enough Trope podcast at Just Enough Trope on Twitter, we are doing a special kind of segment or side side show where we talk about films, both classic and modern, uh, like Rashomon. Like, man, I've never seen Rashomon. I heard it's good. That's our lists that we're going through, uh, me and my broadcasting partner. So check us out on Twitter, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts from. And that is it for us for this week. We'll see you soon. And until then, keep on trekking.